the Israel-Hamas war has entered its 14th day. The conflict has killed over 4,900 people on both sides. Palestinian Health Authority uh, says a, no a total of 3,540 Palestinians have been killed and over 13,000 are wounded. The conflict has also led to over 1,400 Israelis being killed and over 4,400 people wounded. On Wednesday night, the Israeli military launched multiple airstrikes into Gaza. Several residential buildings were bombed in the Tel Al Hava neighborhood. The latest CCTV footage from the Israeli border town of Sederot showed the first moments of the unprecedented Hamas attack on October 7th. That's when Hamas terrorists began their rampage through nearby communities. Videos show pickup trucks carrying Hamas terrorists driving through the city and targeting several vehicles on their way. In the latest video, two people were seen running from their vehicles after they encountered the Hamas uh, terrorists. Another vehicle was seen on fire on a highway leading to Sederot Center. Rocket warning sirens sounded across the Israeli coastal city of Tel Aviv as tensions between Israeli and ha Israel and Hamas escalate. The ro Hamas rockets were intercepted by Israel's Iron Dome missile defense system. The sounds of explosions echoed across Tel Aviv. Israel has also been escalating its onslaught against Hamas, launching deadly airstrikes along the Gaza Strip. Explosions were also seen and heard across the Gaza skyline on Wednesday. Israeli forces continued to target Hamas centers in Gaza. Israeli defense forces have kept up their bombardment of Gaza since the October 7th attack. Israel is also preparing for a ground offensive and has massed tanks and troops along the Gaza border. The latest satellite images show Gaza's Al Ali Ara hospital before and after the explosion on Tuesday. Over 500 people were killed in a blast that left the hospital ruined. At the time of the uh, blast, the hospital had a large number of injured Palestinians and people seeking shelter. Palestinian officials blamed an Israeli airstrike for the blast. Israel says the explosion was caused by a failed rocket launch by the Palestinian Islamic Jihad group. In his visit to Israel, U.S. President Joe Biden said that the deadly blast at a Gaza, a Gaza Strip hospital appeared to be from an errant rocket fired by a terrorist group. Joe Biden pledged support to Israelis and humanitarian assistance to suffering Palestinians. In his statement, Biden said, and I quote, the United States unequivocally stands for the protection of civilian life during the conflict. He added that the U.S. would provide $100 million in new funding for humanitarian aid in Gaza and the West Bank. Biden also said he would ask the U.S. Congress for unprecedented aid to boost Israel in its fight against Hamas. Meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with the members of his war cabinet. He met them at the Israeli military headquarters to assess the current situation. During the meeting, Netanyahu said this will be a different kind of war because Hamas is a different kind of enemy. He also accused Hamas of maximizing civilian casualties while Israel was seeking to minimize them. The meeting was held following U.S. President Joe Biden's Tel Aviv visit. Earlier, Biden told the Israeli war cabinet that the U.S. will continue to have Israel's back as the country fights to defend its people. U.S. President Joe Biden unveiled a deal to allow desperately needed humanitarian aid to enter war-torn Gaza. One million people have fled their homes amid the Israeli strikes. After face-to-face -face talks in Israel and intense telephone diplomacy with Egypt, Biden said a limited number of trucks would be allowed to cross the shuttered Rafah crossing from Egypt into Gaza. It will be the first international relief to enter Gaza since the October 7th Hamas attack. While aid from Egypt would enter Gaza, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Israel will not allow supplies to be sent into Gaza from its side. Netanyahu added that Israel won't stop aid entering Gaza from Egypt and that this decision was taken after a request from Biden. However, he added that Israel would continue the blockade of humanitarian aid from Israel into Gaza as long as the hostages taken by Hamas on October 7th are not returned. Egypt, the only state apart from Israel to share a border with the Gaza Strip, has been stockpiling aid on its side of the border. But truck, trucks have been unable to cross amid Israel's heavy airstrike in its war with Hamas. 
Dozens of boxes with 30 tons of aid for Gaza have been sent by the Venezuelan government and it has arrived in Egypt. Red Crescent volunteers loaded the boxes into vehicles at the Al Arish airport. The aid cont contains non-perishable food, water, first aid kits and medical supplies. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro said he spoke by phone to Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas about the situation in Gaza. Maduro also pressed for the establishment of a humanitarian aid corridor to help the local population. The 30 tons of humanitarian aid were agreed upon during the call. Meanwhile, explosions took place at the Israeli side of the Lebanon border. This comes a day after Israel exchanged fire with the Lebanon-based Hezbollah group. Large plumes of smoke rose over the border area after the explosions. Violence escalated on the Lebanese border earlier this week, with six heavily armed Hezbollah fighters killed during operations against Israel. The Israel-Lebanon border is witnessing its most serious flare-up in 17 years. Protests have escalated in the West Bank as Israeli forces continue to bomb Gaza. Some protesting Palestinians set barricades on fire in the West Bank. On Wednesday, two Palestinians were killed in clashes with Israeli forces in the city of Ramallah. Hundreds carrying Palestinian flags protested against Israel's military action after the deadly hospital blast in Gaza. They also raised slogans against Israel. Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi blamed Israel for the explosion which struck the Gaza hospital. In an address, Raisi said the Israeli attack on the hospital marked the beginning of the end of the Zionist regime. Raisi was addressing a large crowd of protesters in Tehran who came out in support of Palestinians. Raisi also accused US President Joe Biden of being a partner in the crimes of Israel. An urgent meeting of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, or the OIC, took place in the Saudi Arabian city of Jeddah. At the meeting, Iran's foreign minister called on OIC members to impose an oil embargo and other sanctions on Israel. Iran also called on members to expel all Israeli ambassadors to their countries. The Iranian FM also called for the formation of a team of lawyers to document potential war crimes committed by Israel in Gaza. Both the Palestinian and Israeli envoys to the United Nations have slammed the UN Security Council. The Palestinian envoy blamed it for being unable to pass a resolution for a humanitarian pause in the war between Israel and Hamas to allow aid to reach civilians in Gaza. The Palestinian ambassador to the UN also lashed out at Israel, blaming it for killing hundreds of civilians in Gaza. He also reiterated the Palestinian claim that Israel is responsible for the bombing of the Al Ali Arab Hospital in Gaza. Meanwhile, Israel's ambassador to the United Nations also slammed the UNSC and said that the world body failed to condemn Hamas. In a fiery speech, the Israeli ambassador said the only solution to stop Hamas and to ensure such as atrocities do not happen again was the, quote-unquote, utter obliteration of this satanic entity. He added that calling for calm, restraint and ceasefires is like putting a band-aid on a bullet wound. He said such steps will not eradicate the cancer that is, that is Hamas. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and U.K. Defense Minister Grant Sharps met at the Pentagon to discuss the ongoing Israel-Hamas war. The meeting focused on asset deployment to further prevent destabilization in West Asia. Since the Hamas attack, the U.S. military has sought to deter other Israeli adversaries by moving assets into the region. This includes moving the USS Gerald R. Ford Carrier Strike Group and the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower to the eastern Mediterranean. Hundreds of Jewish peace activists protested in Washington, calling on the Biden administration and the U.S. Congress to press for a ceasefire. Around 200 protesters, many from the group Jewish Voice for Peace, filled the rotunda of the Cannon House office building near the U.S. Capitol. The protesters chanted, the world is watching. The U.S. Capitol Police said it arrested protesters who refused to comply with orders to disperse. Hundreds of protesters in Egypt's capital protested outside Cairo University in support of Palestinians. The protesters raised banners with pictures of children injured in the Israeli strikes on Gaza since October 7th. 
They also called for the opening of the Rafah border crossing to allow humanitarian aid to flow into the enclave. Egypt says aid has not been allowed in due to Israeli bombardments. Thousands gathered outside the Israeli and U.S. consulates in Turkey's Istanbul following the Gaza hospital explosion that killed around 500 people. Protesters tried to storm the Israeli consulate and launched fireworks in the direction of the building. The protesters raised anti-Israel slogans and called for revenge against the country. In other political news, Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov met his North Korean counterpart in Pyongyang. Lavrov's visit to North Korea is seen as a prelude to a potential visit by Russian President Vladimir Putin. This indicates increased cooperation between Russia and North Korea. Russia expressed gratitude to North Korea for its support in the Ukraine conflict. Moscow also pledged its full support for North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Russia says its forces destroyed multiple Ukrainian army warehouses. It alleged that Ukraine conducted an airstrike on its Crimean Peninsula. Russia also said its Black Sea fleet destroyed an unmanned Ukrainian speedboat. Remember, the Crimean Pen Peninsula was annexed by Russia in 2014. Meanwhile, Ukraine confirmed that its armed forces are pressing on with their counteroffensive operations. China signed contracts worth $97.2 billion at the Belt and Road Forum. China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi said they will be focusing on green development for the initiative's next stage. The leaders of over 1,300 countries attended the forum, including Russian President Vladimir Putin. Chinese President Xi Jinping highlighted the Belt and Road Initiative's achievements in building global infrastructure. Scientists from China, South Korea and Canada visited a port near the Fukushima nuclear plant to collect fish and seawater samples. It was the first such effort since Japan started releasing treated wastewater from the nuclear plant in August. Fresh fish samples were gathered directly from boats at the Hisanahoma fishing port in the Fukushima prefecture. These samples will undergo independent testing in each country's laboratory. Japan's release of treated nuclear wastewater into the Pacific Ocean has triggered concerns from nearby nations. Former U.S. President Donald Trump appeared for a civil fraud case trial in New York. Trump said the trial is distracting him from his ongoing presidential campaign. This is the third week of the trial. The case centers on allegations that Trump inflated his total net, net worth to seek favorable loan terms. The first new U.S. deportation flight landed in Venezuela, carrying over 100 people. The U.S. has resumed deportation flights under the Biden administration's stricter border enforcement policies. The Biden administration has been dealing with a record number of people attempting to cross the U.S.-Mexico border illegally. Meanwhile, the U.S. government eased oil, gas and gold sanctions on Venezuela. This comes after an agreement for international election monitoring next year. However, some sanctions on Venezuela by the U.S. still remain. U.S. Republican Party lawmaker Jim Jordan has stumbled again in his bid for Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives. Jordan fell short of votes for the second time. 22 Republicans and all 212 Democrats voted against him. This will be the 16th day that the U.S. House of Representatives will remain without a Speaker. Thousands of Spanish citizens are waiting for acting Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez to grant them amnesty. These citizens were a part of the Catalonia re region's secession bid. In exchange for amnesty, Catalonia political parties will help Sanchez set up his administration. The amnesty deal is also a bid to reduce tensions in Catalonia. The UN warns of an urgent race against time to aid earthquake-affected communities in Afghanistan before winter. Many Afghans, especially in Herat city, are sleeping outdoors due to fears of more aftershocks. Various organizations, including the International Organization for Migration, UN Refugee Agency and UNICEF, are supplying emergency shelter and water services for those affected. 
In less than 15 days, three powerful earthquakes hit western Afghanistan's Herat province. Over 1,500 people lost their lives and about 2,000 are injured. More than 3,300 homes have also been destroyed. Moving to sports, here are the updates from the Cricket World Cup. New Zealand beat Afghanistan by 149 runs in yesterday's match. The Black Caps went to bat first and scored 288 runs for the loss of six wickets in their in innings. Afghanistan were unable to complete their 50 overs. They were bowled out for just 139 runs in the 34th over. Afghanistan captain Hashmatullah Shahidi expressed his concerns with fielding after the loss to New Zealand. Shahidi says, and I quote, I'm very disappointed because at this level you have to take catches. The Afghan captain added that the team needed to improve its fielding overall. In total, Afghanistan dropped five catches in yesterday's match. Meanwhile, New Zealand displayed top-notch fielding against Afghanistan. Mitchell Santner took a stunning one-handed leaping catch to dismiss Afghan captain Shahidi. Following Santner's brilliance, several spectators started chanting, number one catch. Apart from splendid fielding, Mitchell Santner also had a great day with the ball. Santner took three wickets in yesterday's match against Afghanistan. He bowled eight overs and gave away just 39 runs. Santner is now the leading wicket taker at the World Cup with 11 dismissals. Meanwhile, New Zealand batter Devon Conway currently tops the list of highest run scorers at this World Cup. Conway scored 20 runs against Afghanistan, but that was enough to put him at the top of the chart with 249 runs in the tournament so far. Conway is ahead of Pakistan batter Mohammad Rizwan by just one run. New Zealand have also become the number one team at the World Cup. The Black Caps have won all four of their matches and have secured eight points. New Zealand are ahead of second-placed India by two points and third-placed South Africa by four points. England all-rounder Ben Stokes was seen batting at the practice nets yesterday. England captain Joss Butler says that Stokes is all set to return to the squad for the next match against South Africa. Stokes has already missed England's first three matches at the World Cup. England will face South Africa on Saturday in Mumbai's Vankade Stadium. India faced Bangladesh in the World Cup match today. The game will be played at the Maharashtra Cricket Association Stadium in Pune. India will look to win uh, their fourth game in a row. Bangladesh are hoping to make a comeback, having won just one out of their three matches. Meanwhile, India captain Rohit Sharma was fined by traffic police yesterday. Sharma was caught over speeding on the expressway that connects the Indian cities of Mumbai and Pune. Sharma was slapped with three fines for reckless driving and breaking traffic regulations. The Indian skipper was reportedly driving his vehicle at speeds of over 200 km per hour. As per reports, the International Cricket Council, or ICC, is unlikely to take action against India. This is regarding a complaint filed by Pakistan's cricket board against the crowd at Ahmedabad Stadium. Pakistan have complained that the Indian crowd was unfriendly towards Pakistani players.